The other thing that we started doing on our pork butts that I'm sure a lot of people do, but you use a binder and a lot of people use mustard and not because of the flavor, just for the binder. And we use, because we're Americans and we love sugar, we use maple syrup. From the blog Random Sweets, I'm Stacy Mergenthal, and this is Funeral Potatoes and Wool Mittens, a show for people who embrace the warm and cozy spirit of everyday living in the northern Midwest. And talk about northern Midwest. <laughs> Today, my North Dakota brother-in-law, Russell Ziegler, joins us to talk about cold smoking cheese, smoking pork butt, and how he turns a plain old pork shoulder into an incredibly flavorful smoked ham that practically shreds itself at the sight of a fork. Him and his wife Betsy and their two kids Grace and Russell Jr. live in Mandan where they spend summers cruising the Missouri River on their pontoon and winters just pretty much digging out of snow. Russell's a coal miner and he served four years as a United States Marine. He actually comes from a family of a lot of military personnel. He's served our country in Missouri, Florida, Alaska, and he even spent time in Japan and North Korea. And I think it's only fitting that I get to share his episode on Memorial Weekend. Russell, thank you for your service. Russell has seen a lot of the world, which he says has taught him tolerance and respect for people and cultures, which is very true. But like many dads of coal miners' daughters, I know that he has a gun and I don't think he's afraid to use it. He steals the show on the dance floor, and he's really a fun guy to be a Mergenthal outlaw with. In this episode, Russell is sharing some of his smoking secrets, and now I know why they go through so much maple syrup. <laughs> well, we also share Betsy's recipe for cilantro lime slaw, which is really the crown to all meats, and we forgot to share it in Betsy's episode last week, so we're sharing it today. And also, just like in Betsy's episode... We get on the topic of Kugen, the German dessert cake Kugen, and Russell's aunt Henrietta. Now, while you're listening, take a look at the photos, and you can get the links from this episode on randomsweets.com. And before we get started, please subscribe if you're new here and rate and review this podcast. And now it's time to go hog wild with Russell Ziegler. All right, so Russell Ziegler is with us today. Russell Sr. Just tell tell everybody, I love that. Okay, here, when you do your Snapchats and you do, this is your daily coal miner, whatever, do that because I love it. And then tell people what you do for a living. Well, this is your friendly uh, North Dakota coal miner here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm a, I work for the Falker Coal Mine. And I work in the reclamation department running heavy equipment, and we restore the land back to the way it was before the mi- the coal was extracted from the earth. So, And so there's a whole coal mine out there where they're mining the coal, and then you're coming in afterward. Is that what no, you're doing? It w- it's no, it's all part of the same thing. So what we do is we remove the topsoil, then the subsoil, because that has to be put back the same way it was, right, so you can grow stuff obviously sure. right once once the coal mine is done with the land and then they come through and they mine the you know dig down to the coal take the coal out and then once that's done we level everything that back and then put the subsoil and topsoil back up onto it so it's all part of the same process it's about a three-year process from the time that we take the topsoil off the land till the time we put the topsoil back on the land is about a three-year process. Wow. So that's kind of it. Then the coal goes straight over to our uh, power plant, which is Coal Creek Station, which is owned by a company local here in Bismarck called uh, Rainbow Industries, and they own that. So that's everything's kind of local here. And then the uh, North American Coal is is uh, based out of Texas, and then they own a bunch of North Ameri- uh, a bunch of coal mines and um, other mining plants, but all over the country here in the uh, United States. And so where you have to drive how far to get, because where is the, the coal mine actually that you're going to? It's up there in McLean County, which is north of Bismarck. Where I go is about 51 miles north one way, and that's where I check in for my shift change and then uh, we go to wherever we're digging the dirt obviously now I, it's been a long time since i've seen pictures but i've seen pictures of 
little Russell Jr. when he was really small out by some of your equipment and he's this tiny little thing compared to what you're out there working in. What kind of equipment are you driving? When Jason and I were driving up here yesterday to North Dakota, we passed this truck that was hauling tires that were, I mean, it wouldn't right, fit the, in this hotel room. They're yeah, so big. The, he's the, like, that's the kind of stuff that Russell's got out there. The the tires on our big coal truck, our big um, overburden trucks, dump trucks, those are 13 foot. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, they're, they're, they're absolutely ginormous. And uh, we have three different size overburden trucks out there, dump trucks. We have a uh 777 caterpillars which are one they call a hundred ton and then we have a 789 which hauls 200 ton and then we have a 793 and those haul 240 ton no max obviously and then uh so that's what our uh overburden trucks are which is which is what you call dirt anything that's <laughs> not coal is considered overburden oh, okay. and then our coal trucks our crest trucks uh, that's just the brand, obviously, and then they haul 200 tons. So they can haul 200 ton of coal. And what are you? What are you driving or operating? I should I say. Operate, not, you're not just driving around the coal mine. Well, a little bit, Give I me guess. Your daily updates. So um, I, um, I'm a just considered a heavy equipment operator out there. I can operate anything. We have 24 foot motor graders out there. Caterpillar. Most of the stuff we have is Caterpillar, and then we have you know D11 dozers, and we have. We have a little bit of everything out there because you got to move all kinds of dirt. So we have everything from big, huge, giant drag lines to a little bit skid, little tiny skidsters because you got to move all kinds of different dirt. So sure. we got a little bit of everything out there, and pretty much I operate it all. And we so we have a coal miner's daughter in the family. <laughs> That's right. Right, because we have Grace, and so it's fun to have a coal miner's daughter, and we get a kick out of that. Yeah. Well, you grew up in Belfouche, South Dakota, and so I think when I first met you, were you a, not a parole officer, you were a... Were you a, a I was a correctional officer at a juvenile jail there yeah. in Rapid City. It was where uh, my wife and my family and I were living, and we were living in Rapid City. And I lived, worked for the Pennington County uh, Juvenile Service Center there, uh, housing uh, juvenile delinquents and everything. So yeah, that's that was an interesting job seven years there that was that was interesting yes oh i bet i kind of had forgotten about that and then you guys actually moved here for the for the job right yes that's correct we we wanted uh one of those life changes when uh when our son was born uh, we realized that between my son and then grace that we were spending more money on almost all of Betsy's money was going, that she was making at her job was going straight to pay for daycare to pay mm. somebody else to raise our kids. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to make a change so that we could try to afford for Betsy to stay home and raise our kids. And that's what we decided to do. Mm -hmm. And so she homeschools Russell Jr., which has been a godsend. And it actually, actually really has, yeah. Yeah, that's really fun. She's a good teacher and she does so many. I told her that I love when she talks about the places that you go when you do your fun trips, but she's always incorporating some sort of fun education piece that Russell Jr. just really gets a kick out of, I think, to right. learn stuff. Well, once, you, once you really grasp the fact that everything is, is school, mm -hmm. everything is school, everything that you do, and then if you can take it and turn it into a teaching experience, and then she takes that and she takes it into the classroom, a.k.a. our house, and she <laughs> uses that to to use it as tools for him to learn, you know, all kinds of things from reading to math to whatever. And so everything you do is, is learning. And, and I, and I love that. Right. And everywhere you go, you have an opportunity. If you, like you said, if you realize it and take the opportunity. So before I even knew you and I don't know much about, so that's why I want to ask you about your time. You're a Marine. Yes, ma'am. So I want to, yeah, yes, ma'am. So I, I just, we just tell us a little bit about that because I don't know anything about where well, you served, how long you were, anything. I, I joined in October 14th of 1996. Okay. And then, and then I served till October 13th of 2000. Wow. That's four years. Mm -hmm. um, and then everybody from this side of the Mississippi goes to San Diego f for recruit training. And then everybody on the other side goes to North Carolina uh, to Paris Island for recruit training. So I went to San Diego for recruit training. Um down there and then I went to well all kinds of places I went <laughs> to um, Missouri I went to Florida I went to Alaska I went to Japan uh, I spent a little bit of time in North Korea 
And so I got to see a little bit of the world in, in those four years. So mm-hmm. Thank you. I mean, people don't know what to say other than thank you for your service because in America, this is what we're about and our freedom. And I know we feel very strongly about that in our family too. Absolutely, absolutely mm-hmm. we do, yes. It was, a, it was a good experience. I didn't, one of those things where I didn't know what I wanted to do when I got out of high school. Mm. My dad was a, was, is a Marine and then, uh, so I definitely wasn't gonna let him show me up. So I, <laughs> I went ahead and joined too. And then um, I just, it was a good time. And, uh, uh, it's like anything else in this world. There's bad things and there's good things, but it was it was mainly all good experiences, and I got to see a little bit of the world, and I got to mm-hmm. see, know a lot of people from all over the world and and uh, all over the country. And then you get to learn customs from other areas and of the country and the world, you know. And the, you you get to learn tolerances too, you know. You get mm-hmm. to learn that just your way of doing things up in in the midwest isn't the only way they do things in the world or even in the united states for that matter and Mm -hmm. so it teaches you to build a little bit of tolerance and and uh you respect their stuff and you respect your stuff and and it and hopefully they do the same and you learn and we were just talking earlier today about so your dad was a marine then you have two uncles that served army and navy or no, I, I had uh, both my uncles on my dad's side were in the army. Okay. Uncle Dwayne and Uncle Dale were both in the army. Uncle Dale served in Germany, and um, Uncle Dwayne and my dad were both in Vietnam, and they were actually in Vietnam at the same time, hmm. which is a, which is the reason Uncle Dale couldn't go, because at that time you can't send all the sons to war at the same time okay. in case they all um, died. Right. Sure. Mm-hmm. So. So he didn't go, and then um, so those so my uncle Dwayne and my dad did go, and then my mom is married to Doug Lang, and he was in the army, and he was in the he was in Vietnam also. So I guess I know a lot of people that served. Always kind of respected that about people. Sure, and so a big shout out to all the Absolutely. military members of military. Yeah. And and so your mom. That's one thing I wanted to ask you about today because I've just kind of learned this weekend. As you guys are preparing for a lot of family to be here for RJ's confirmation, your mom is coming, and Betsy talked about the German from the Germans from Russia. The Germans from Russia, and so the heritage and the food, and that's why she's making some of this food tonight with the sauerkraut and and the nephla. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an interesting, and I wish I, I I should know more about it than I really do. <laughs> Germans went to Russia to farm the land they're invited over there by the queen that I can't remember what her don't name look was. at me for history <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, the wrong like I said one. I wish, but anyway they went over there and then after um, there was another coup in Russia like there is every couple you know years mm-hmm. and and uh, they were pushed out and so then they came to America to settle and they settled in a couple of different places but they settled prominently in western South Dakota or eastern South Dakota and mm-hmm. eastern North Dakota and so there's certain areas that are very strong and if you go into especially northern eastern south dakota you can go from town to town and you can kind of see the difference you'll see go into one town and there'll be just a huge lutheran church then you go to the next town and there's just a huge catholic church and they kind (laughs) of settled that way okay and so where did your mom grow up she grew up just just um southeast of here in a little town called wishick Oh, so here in North Dakota. Yep, here in North Dakota, okay. yes. And her name's Joanne. So I her should name is Joanne, that. yeah. yes, that's right. Okay. And the Gauls from, from Wishick, North Dakota. And then my dad grew up on a little farm north of McCluskey, North Dakota. So. Okay. And that is that where, where is he still? Where is your dad at? He is in Sheridan, Wyoming now by the Bighorns. That's right. Which is one of the things I hope he never moves because we love going out there, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's an annual trip that you take, oh, four-wheel. Yeah. We, we go out there several times a year, wintertime and then in the summertime to go out there. So it's it's. I love seeing your pictures when you guys go because I've it's a place I've never been. So other than your pictures and what you talk about, I don't know anything about it. Yeah, it's it's, it's the mountains, but everything has its beauty, right? Like uh, you can talk about the river here and yeah. you can talk about the prairie and all of it has its beauty. Right, and the mountains are no different. They have their beauty, and, and it's it's something to go see and, and to enjoy, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about some food. Excellent. <laughs> so because of you, Jason and I smoke cheese. 
because if I remember correctly, I mean, I should ask Jason, but I'm pretty sure we came here, you had smoked cheese, and we were like, we have to do this. And we went home and smoked cheese. So now we do that. Talk about how to smoke cheese. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, well, smoking cheese, doesn't it melt in there? <laughs> that, that Really, that's the first question people right. ask you. They're like, doesn't it melt when you when you cook it? And you're like, so it's a it's a cold smoke. Um, and uh, so which cold smoke just means that you try to keep the temperature under 90 degrees. And uh, so most cheeses that you buy um, are, they have a, that is their melting temperature. It's kind of an average set that they set. Oh. Um, obviously, you can buy cheese that have higher melting temperatures, and those are the kinds that you put in, like, your sausages and stuff like that when you make sausage. So you try to keep the temperature under 90 degrees, so obviously you're going to want to try to do it on a cool day, mm-hmm. right? Oh, good point. Sm- <laughs> right, you know. And so when, what we did is we bought a smoke tube, and what a smoke tube is is the one we bought is made, it's called Amazine, a-M-A-Z-E-N, amazing oh. tube is what is, is the brand, and you can get them pretty much anywhere. You you know you can buy smoking material, and those ones are made for the pellets. You can also buy like uh, smoke boxes, or just a little box where you can put like wood chips, which are exactly as they sound, just little pieces of wood in there, and then you light them on fire, and then they just smolder, and then could produce a smoke or whatever so anything that you can buy like that would do the trick I myself I have a smoker so then I put that tube into the smoker but you could really use anything you wanted to if you had an old cooler you could drill a hole in the top of it and put your cheese and your you know your Mm. tube smoker in there and just let it barrel away you know it would ruin the cooler but you could use (laughs) almost anything you wanted to use you know and then what this amazing tube takes is these little wood pellets and all those are is they're uh, they they take cedar or they take cherry wood or something like that and then they grind it down into a sawdust they, then they soak it in water and then they compress it with with extreme pressure and heat and dries it real fast and then it stays into a small little pellet that way and then you can you put those in there and you light it on fire and then you blow it out and then it just smolders like a cigarette and sure. then it just smolders and then you know, obviously in the closed confinement and then, it, you know, smokes the cheese or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then um, those tubes will smoke for about three hours and how much you want to smoke your cheese is kind of up to you on depending on, I mean, how much you like the smoky flavor. I myself really like the smoky flavor on Me the cheese. Too. So I smoke it for quite a while. I think I do about three hours when I smoke cheese because I just really like it to soak in. And then I also cut the chunks a little bit smaller. They're usually about oh an inch thick is all I usually have the cheese, so it, the smoke oh. can really penetrate well. So you're not just placing the block on. No, yeah, I, I cut it, it so that bit. it's. Okay. Uh, my chunks are usually around. They're about an inch thick, and then maybe three inches by five inches. What do you put them? Do you put them in foil or something? Or? I don't. You just put them straight on a rack because you need the smoke to. To surround it. The other okay. thing that I do that you probably wouldn't have to do because the smoke surrounds the cheese is I like to turn the cheese too, just mainly because I think I need something to do. But <laughs> but I, I go in there about every about every thirty minutes. I'll, I'll crack open the door of the smoker and then I'll I'll rotate the cheese to try oh. to make to try to ensure that it gets a good uh, smoke on all, every side of the cheese or whatever. So I like to do that and then. After you're done, and depending on the temperature, the, the cheese will get a little what they call sweaty. And mm-hmm. so you take that and you, you dry that off, and then you wrap it almost immediately in a foil. Um, I will usually do like a saran wrap, but you can do a tin foil, whatever you'd like to do. And then the, if you put it in the refrigerator, and the longer you can leave it wrapped before you actually open it up and cut into it, that's actually the stronger the the flavor, the smoke flavor will become inside the cheese. It almost seals it in there. How it works, I don't I, I don't know, but <laughs> I just know that it does. Mm-hmm. And so um, those are just some tricks to get it the smoke flavor to really go in. Obviously, you can cut into it right away and eat it if you you know you want or whatever. But if you and then also if you let it cool down and then before you slice into it, the pieces are less the the pieces of cheese are less likely to stick together because when they're a little warmer obviously they're going to stick together a little bit more so if you cut into it right away they're going to stick if you let it cool in the refrigerator for a day or two and then slice it then the pieces aren't 
aren't going to stick as much as they would otherwise. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you want to up your game for any anything, be the person that brings the smoked cheese. I'm just telling you. <laughs> yeah, it's it actually is. It's I really like it. It goes and you can take it anywhere. You can take it on the boat here, mm -hmm. and you could take it camping you can i mean just anywhere you want to go you can take it and it's a nice little snack you know? and you can use it in other dishes so when i just did the funeral potatoes or the cheesy hash brown podcast which i should mention russell i love so much that you listen to pretty much every episode and you message me and i just i love it because i don't i don't really I do this podcast and then I hope people listen and I don't really hear much or feedback or anything, but you have always been a big cheerleader and encourager f for me to do this. So first, before I forget, I want to say thank you because it does mean a lot. But in that funeral potatoes one, I was talking because I just did that one by myself and I'm like, oh, I know what we need to do. We need to smoke cheese and then use it in the cheesy hash brown potatoes. I think that would be, I, I remember and you then, saying that. It and then really we need to put the cheesy hash browns on the smoker and smoke the whole dish. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? That smoke would be good. I, th I think that would be really good because yeah. the potatoes would really would get on a smoke flavor mm -hmm. and that would probably be delicious. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you can serve the cheese, the smoked cheese, with your cheese and crackers and your summer sausage and stuff. But I'm also thinking about all the dishes you could then grate the cheese and use it in dishes that you use cheese for. Absolutely. Okay, and so <laughs> pork butt. I want to talk about pork butt. And right before we started recording, you told you surprised me with something that you do. And I, we definitely, I need to hear about this. So first talk about smoking your pork butts and then talk about how you turn it into ham. Okay. Yeah, so we smoke pork butts, Boston pork butts, which is actually just a pig shoulder. I'm not 100% sure why Boston decided to call it a pork butt. But <laughs> well, that, that. Anyway, so uh, one thing that we, we started doing, uh, which was actually my wife Betsy's idea, is the, one of the first times we smoked a pork butt, I kind of ran out of time and I didn't plan long enough, so we took it off the smoker, which uh, the meat will only soak in smoke flavor for a certain amount of time anyway. So then you, mm. once you get it to the stall stage, which is 160 degrees, you usually cover it up anyway, and it's it's just cooking it after that. Mm -hmm. So we stuck it in a crock pot to cook in there, and uh, it just and then it just soaks and 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 cooks in its own juices, which is fantastic. And so that's the way we like to finish ours out. I've also heard people talk about using a pressure cooker to finish it off quicker once it gets to that stall point and you're oh. no longer pushing in the smoke. Mm -hmm. That one you have to really watch, obviously, because you don't want to cook it too much in the pressure cooker. So the other, so once we started doing that, I started to. So a lot of people they smoke a pork, but they leave. There's a slab of fat on that on the pork butt that they'd leave on there because you want it to moisten up the meat as it cooks so that it doesn't dry out. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we cut that off and we leave that off. So now smoke penetrates the meat from every side of the pork butt now because fat usually stops the smoke from entering in. So and then we finish it off in the crock pot. So now it's soaking in its own juices, so it doesn't get dry. Okay. So you don't have to worry about it getting dry. And then we also, it actually helps the bark create a little bit more on the outside too. So you still have, even though you cook it in the crock pot, you still have a couple of chunky pieces which I enjoy <laughs> that are in there. So the other thing that we started doing on our pork butts that I'm sure a lot of people do, but you use a binder, and a lot of people use mustard, and not because of the flavor just for the binder and we use because we're americans and we love sugar we use maple syrup so we put oh. maple syrup on the outside and then i put all the seasonings on or whatever that uh, to create the bark and then i also take garlic uh, powder and mix it with applesauce apple juice and we inject i inject a bunch of apple juice with garlic all over the pork butt inside the pork butt so it's it's penetrated with sugar <laughs> and so it's surrounded by sugar and penetrated by sugar so then when it's done obviously it's a little sweeter mm -hmm. so then that adds with the smokiness and then um obviously all the flavors of the garlic and the, and the black pepper and everything that you put on it you also have a real nice sweet taste to it also which i believe goes really good with pork right yeah yeah so you're doing the maple syrup and all of that to the pork butt 
before you're putting it on the smoker. That's right. That's all right. Of that. You, okay. You, yeah, after it's all thawed and it's room temperature, you put I put maple syrup all over the outside, and then <laughs> I take my garlic and and uh, uh, pepper and um, all my other mixtures and that I do together, and I put it all over the outside of it, and then I put it onto the smoker, and then and then. Um, yeah, and then I let her cook for about, well, until it hits the stall stage. Somewhere around 140 to 160 is what you get it. But as long as it's been more than four hours, then four, you know okay. that the smoke has gotten about as much penetration into the meat as, as it's going to get. Okay. And then I take it off and I put it into the crock pot and let it finish in there in a nice, slow, slow cook so that it just, and then it just cooks in its own juices and it's it's phenomenal, you know. Jason and I tried to do that once, and I think we didn't have it in the crock pot long enough. Or, well, well, we did. I think we anticipated it not having to be in there very long, and we ate at, like, 10 o'clock at night because by the time it was ready. So we didn't plan far enough ahead for timing. So when you're smoking it and you're saying about four hours and then put it in the crock pot to finish it off on a low setting, do you have an idea how long that is that it's you know because to be honest with you i don't because our crock pot doesn't have a temperature so i'm not sure what you cook it at for how long but um we've done both where we've cooked it on our our, our crock pot's high temp mm-hmm. and on our low temp low temp it's going to take about a good eight hours before yeah. it's done see and we and, did not anticipate that yeah, so i think but we thought we it, were going to eat at four o'clock in the afternoon and here we are at 10 at night yeah finally it's, it's ready right but okay. if you put it on high um it's usually about six hours after so it's going to be about a 10 hour deal total until and you can usually tell um when you put the crock butt you put the pork butt in the crock pot you can usually tell once that bone starts popping out and it's clean Hmm. there's no meat sticking to it no more and it starts it almost forces itself out of there okay once it starts doing that then it's almost 100 percent. and you should be able to take your fork you know take the lid off and take your fork and you sh- there should be no resistance whatsoever. You just peel that meat right off. And then okay. then you kind of know when if you can pull that bone out and then there's nothing sticking to it. But if you go to pulling that bone and it won't pull out, yep. then it's it's not ready yet. Yeah, so see, that's, that's what we kept trying to do. And then we're like, it's not ready, it's not ready. And yeah. we just didn't anticipate how many hours it takes. So a lot of hours, but so worth it. I it mean, is. It really it's, is. Yeah, in my opinion, mm-hmm. it is. Yeah, it's just yep. fantastic. And you can eat it with so many different things. Well, you could smork that smork. <laughs> you could smoke that pork butt in the morning, early or overnight, whatever. Then throw it in your crock pot. Go out on the lake. Go out on the river. Come home, and you have this Absolutely. amazing. And that's that's what we did when you served it to us. I think we came home to your place that night, and we had this amazing pork. That's that's exactly so. That's what I try to do when I um, anticipate that I'm going to to smoke a pork butt. Is I'll get up and I'll have it on the pork. I'll have it on the smoker about. Well, I don't know, six o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, by 10 o'clock, it's starting to warm up outside and time to go down to the river. I take it out of there, I put it in the crock pot, and we go on the river, we come home. And the other thing that happens is once you start sh- shredding that meat down into them juices, it's just, the crock pot's just full of juices, you know, this, mm. the rendered fat. Then you take it and you just, you just stir it inside there, and then those juices, like, they go back into the meat after you shred it. And so then it's and then it's just absolutely juicy and, and uh, smoky and, and obviously sweet because of all the sugar I put on it. But not too sweet, though. No. But, it, I mean, it's surprisingly not that. When you're talking about all of that, it wasn't so sweet. No. I mean, it was, but not like. Right. It's not, not overwhelmingly sweet or right. nothing like that. Yeah. So. Oh, I'm just kicking myself now, Russell, because you know what I just thought of when I'm thinking about when you guys serve those with little taco shells? That coleslaw, or not the coleslaw, but the the cilantro slaw that Betsy made, I completely forgot to have her talk about that. Yeah, she makes, so we do street tacos with her, and uh, what, what Betsy does is she makes, she takes coleslaw, and then she takes cilantro, and she makes it together, and then she puts a little lime juice on it. Mm-hmm. And so basically, she just takes coleslaw, or, uh, um, you know, uh, cabbage. She buys the, the like pre- the angel hair slaw. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Prepackaged it's, mix. Right. It's prepackaged. That's exactly right. And mm-hmm. then she just takes it and she picks in a bunch of cilantro, which is absolutely phenomenal on tacos, right? Yep. And then she just and then when she mixes it in good, then she just squeezes a, a lime on top of it, and that lime, 
I don't know what it does, but it just brings out a little bit of something in that pork that it, yeah. it's absolutely phenomenal. You don't even need salsa really or nothing. You just no. take a little of that slaw and you take a little bit of that pork and you put it on a shell and it's fantastic. You mm-hmm. know, it, it really is really good. Darn, yep. That was the other thing when I had said to her that we went home and made that ranch dip and we smoked cheese. <laughs> we pretty much recreate and the Mexican corn that she made, like everything you guys made that weekend, we went home and made because we enjoyed the food so much and I completely forgot about that slaw. I add a little sea salt. I think she made, I don't know if she does or not, but I add a little sea salt to it and then it starts to really soak in those juices from the limes. I'm sure, I'm sure there's some tricks oh that she gosh. does that I'm not even thinking about right now because she's just one of those cooks that knows those tricks. But, but it's, again, it's one of those really simple things, but it's incredible. So it I'm glad really I just good, remembered yeah, that. I, Let's talk about how you make ham then. Super okay. excited about this one. <laughs> so... Um, I didn't come up with this. Somebody else told me about it, and then I just did a little research, and then I take a pork butt and then put it in a brine, and I cure it. And then you take it, it's, you add just all kinds of seasoning, and then you have to add curing salt number two. And so a lot of people think that curing salt and, like, um, your Himalayan salt are the same thing, and there's really not. Okay. So your curing salt has a high concentrate of nitrate, sodium nitrate in it. And so, and that's what penetrates the muscles of whatever meat you're trying to cure so that it doesn't break down. It protects it from breaking down with the enzymes and everything like that so it doesn't rot, which is why they used to do it before refrigerating. They would (laughs) cure meat so that it wouldn't rot so you could keep it. Mm -hmm. And so, but that high concentrate of sodium nitrate, if you would just eat it or put it on something and eat it, it would actually be harmful to you because it your body can't handle that much sodium nitrate. So it's not the same thing as like your regular Himalayan salt, which is different. So anyway, so you take a little bit, it's not much, and you put it in this brine and then other seasonings, obviously, whatever you kind of like to. We put, I put a little bit of uh, a pickling powder in there, which was is surprising, but it doesn't taste like pickling powder when it's done. And pepper, and then um, we put in syrup in there. <laughs> Maple syrup? Maple Are you a syrup. fan of the movie Elf? Yeah. <laughs> Maple it, it, syrup? We're, 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 <laughs> On we're, spaghetti? We're, we're, we're Americans. We like our sugar, and then we put brown, speaking of sugar, we put brown sugar in this brine, and then you bring it to a boil, and then you obviously let it cool down to room temperature, and then you stick your pork butt in there, and then uh, you put it in the refrigerator and make sure it's totally submerged or whatever. And is then it submerged? It, sorry, the brine. Is it all those seasonings go into like a water? A liquid, yep, into a water, yep, to make a brine. Yep, that's okay. right. You're right, and I bring it to a boil. And then uh, you obviously you have to do enough so that it'll cover a pork butt. You have to have okay. a pot big enough so you can put your pork butt in. Yep. Or in the, and then you put it in the refrigerator and you let it sit and let it refrigerate for about a pound a day. So if you got an eight pound pork butt, so about eight days. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. And then you pull it out and you dry it off. And then then after that, it's it's just smoking it, you know. And then again... I take the apple juice and I inject it, and then I take the I take the syrup and I c- cover the whole outside of the thing with syrup and 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 sauces, and then I smoke it, and and then it gets smoke flavor. Then we finish in the crock pot, and then it becomes a pulled ham, a smoked pulled ham, and it's it's absolutely phenomenal. It's really really good. So yeah, I really like it. And so we've done that for a lot of Thanksgivings when instead of a ham or a Christmas, instead of making a Christmas ham, we just mm-hmm. make a pulled ham that I cure or whatever. And it's it's absolutely phenomenal. So we need to start spending more holidays up here in North Dakota with you guys. <laughs> I like you guys that. are welcome at any time, especially Thanks. if you bring some of them treats. Some of my treats. <laughs> That's right. Pulled ham. So that reminds me of, I mean... Back in the day, we used to have scalloped potatoes and ham, and it was always that really good, somehow that shredded type of a ham. And I always have wondered how, why, why am I not finding that anywhere? How do people do that? Well, this is a way to do that. This is definitely a way to do that. And you can, and that's, I mean, I suppose a guy could, because it's cured, so you could probably, if you just wanted a regular, like, to make it like a ham, you could cook it to 160 or something like that and then just slice it. But we cook mm. it all the way to 205 when the when the fat gets rendered and that's when it comes, you know, to that pulled pork and it gets shredded or so easy or whatever. But, yeah, you can eat it. We Betsy makes it with dang near everything. I mean, we put it in um, funeral potatoes and we put it in <laughs> we put it in uh, with scallop and we put it in with just eating it with mashed potatoes. And, 
Uh, it goes really good with potatoes, obviously. Mm-hmm. And um, no, it's just, it's really good. I mean, it's a ham, so anything you can think of a ham and then right. ham sandwiches, you know, it's just a pulled ham sandwich is really good. It's, uh, um, we've really enjoyed breakfast. it. I'm sure it's good for breakfast. Oh, absolutely. Can you freeze it? You know how you can shred up chicken and then freeze it? Can you do that with this ham, do you think? Have you tried you, it? You, or? you can do it with the ham, though. The one problem that you got is is when you're trying to, it's almost better to let it sit in, like, let's say you got it in the crock pot. Mm-hmm. Let, you know, you, you shred it and let it kind of kind of push the meat down into the juices and then let it cool and then scoop it out. So then the, the, the fat becomes solid again and on the meat. So that way when you're scooping it out, all that is with it and you can put it into a container or whatever, whatnot, and freeze it. Okay. We usually do Ziploc bags. And then when you take it back out again and you put it in to whatever pan you're putting it in, crock pot pan, whatever, it's got all the fats with it. So mm-hmm. once it heats up again, it's juicy again. Okay. You scoop it out prior, you're going to leave some of them juices behind and then it, it has more of a likelihood of getting dry. Sure. And that's some of the best part. I guess, yeah, we... Yeah, when the fat we just, is always the best part. Right? <laughs> that comes from the sugar. <laughs> That's right. Um, for Easter, we made a big ham, and then a big ham, but we wanted leftovers, and so I put them in baggies and froze it after we chopped it up, so that later I made a... Took it out the next weekend, one bag, made ham and bean soup. This would be really good in a in a soup, too, that shredded ham. And then I think just last weekend, I took the other bag out and made scalloped potatoes and ham. Betsy makes a really good ham and bean soup, okay. and we have used this for that, and it's it's really good. Mm-hmm. So. so basically we need to spend the summer smoking meats and packing our freezers full. Yeah, that's right. With all the good meats for the, for the winter cooking too. Good. And tonight we're having, do you like sauerkraut? You have oh, to. I that's part of why we're doing it. I, and, I love sauerkraut. Um, it's cabbage is cabbage and potatoes are probably a staple in german food and from everywhere from pigs in a blanket to sauerkraut to you name it we did i can remember my mom and my grandma's just putting it in everything i love it i absolutely love sauerkraut i could i could eat a bunch of it uh, we were talking on before we came up here and betsy was wanted to start getting that supper going and I'm like oh I'll put the sauerkraut in and she's like no no I will do that and because she knows I'll just I'll just put all that we have in there because I just I really like sauerkraut so I I say I scrunch my nose at it and go oh sauerkraut but the way she was talking about how that she was going to do the pork butt with sauerkraut and fried nephla I told her I will try it I am excited to try it I will try it. And I'm like, I like cabbage, so why do I freak out about sauerkraut? sauerkraut I like cabbage. Yeah. I like coleslaw. But I when think... it's fermented, to me it seems weird. And and a lot of people don't make sauerkraut, right? Like you go to a lot of areas and you'll eat like a sauerkraut on a hot dog or something yeah. of that nature. It's straight like it's straight out of the can onto the on the hot dog with all the vinegar and mm-hmm. and everything like that. And real sauerkraut, when it's cooked, like my my mom and my grandmas used to make it, is you take and you take the sauerkraut and you wash the vinegar off and you put it in the pan with the with the pig or the sausage or the beef or whatever you're going to cook with it, and you cook it with that. And it's like a potato where it actually soaks up the flavor of whatever you're cooking it with. The meat, so or, okay. yeah, right, whatever kind of meat it is, and so. When you're done, your sauerkraut doesn't taste like a vinegary, rotten cabbage. It tastes like whatever you were cooking it with, whether it be some kind of sausage, some kind of German sausage, or like some kind of pork or something of that nature. So mm-hmm. I, I absolutely love it. And who in your family makes the Coogan? Well, my Aunt Henrietta and my Aunt Donna, both on my mom's side, were the ones that are probably most famous in our family for making it. My Aunt Henrietta actually made the Coogan. We didn't have cake at our wedding. We had Coogan. And my Aunt Henrietta was the one who made all that Coogan for that ceremony. Unfortunately, she had passed this last year and kind of took that with her. The the recipe, and does she have it written down? Do you yeah, know, that would be a or... great question to ask her kids. I, I hope she has it written down somewhere, right? And then uh, her uh, younger sister, Donna, which is my mom's older sister, she makes a pretty good Coogan herself. She's nothing to shy away from. My mom, I don't think, 
I can never remember my mom ever making it. My mm. sister Jennifer has started making coogan the last couple of years, and she does a pretty good job. I just don't know if everybody will will match Henrietta, you know. That's like my grandma Janet. So we have these family members who make these foods that sometimes, if especially if they don't have it written down, people will spend years trying to perfect because they they want it to taste like with that family member and then there's no recipe. So my grandma's white cookies were that way. It's this particular kind of a different, you use some sour cream and you put, um, I think it's baking soda in the sour cream and let it sit there for a little bit to kind of let it bloom up a little bit. It's a different recipe, sort of an old fashioned. I spent a day in the kitchen with her to learn how to make them and make sure, because even her recipe card, right? It's like a little shows the ingredients and then it just says, mix and do this but it's much more work than that i'm just saying there's an there's a lot of value to well i know that one one i can't remember it, it's been some years ago my my sister jennifer she was bound to determine to get henrietta to write it down and so henrietta did write it down and then she would put things like add this until it looks right and 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 stir until it has the right texture and my sister was like well i don't even know what that means right what it looks like or yeah. feels like you, yeah. you need to so, know yeah. yeah it's hard yep that's something that's pretty important well even when betsy was talking about some of her recipes and she's such an eyeball she eyeballs her things and doesn't mm-hmm. always have things written down but i said well you know grace and rj they're gonna want to know how to make some of those things too so you may need to write some of it down, <laughs> yeah. pass some of those recipes on. Right. Yep, yep. All right. Well, let's see. We're going to eat some Coogan tonight. No, is the Coogan tonight with the German? I, I believe so. I think I, so, and, too. And then my, my wife also makes, which I, I love also, she makes a German potato salad. I don't. It's a lot of work, so I don't know if she's going to make that tonight, too, with all that other stuff. But She and said then, she's going to, so I oh, hope I didn't keep I, her too long. I hope she gets to it. <laughs> I hope she does, too. I, I, I really enjoy that, okay. too. So. Well, maybe we should end the podcast and go help her. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> we might need to go help her bake or make some potatoes or something. Russell, anything else? No, I just thank you for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so glad. We'll we'll hopefully do more because you've got lots of different things you try, and I'm sure this summer you'll do more on your grill or more on your smoker that you want to talk about. And we'll take another pontoon trip down the river and have stories we maybe shouldn't share. <laughs> that would be that would, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So one more time, do your North Dakota daily coal miner, and we're over and out. All right. This is your. Uh, Friendly North Dakota coal miner here. You just have a good day and whatever, what not, and what forth. <laughs> His coal miner reports are so funny. I wish I could subscribe to them. Remember, you'll find the photos and links from this episode on randomsweets.com. And I made sure to include Aunt Henrietta's Coogan recipe there too. For the next episode, my friend Leah Brink came to my house and made strawberry daiquiris before we sat down and talked all things Vitamix and fresh ingredients. So tune in next week for smoothies, frozen cocktails, soup, salsa, bean dip, hummus, and a lot more. Thank you for spending your time with Russell and me today because I know that you have a lot of choices for what you listen to and I'm just so glad that you pressed play here today. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Funeral Potatoes and Wool Mittens and set yourself up to receive notifications when new episodes are available. And be sure to download new episodes to your phone or tablet so that you can listen to them while you're getting your smokers set up early in the morning. Sweet wishes!